Welcome back. Today we are going to talk about animal diversity and evolution of body plans. So everybody who has been waiting for us to get to animals all semester, you made it! So now we're moving from our plant friends to the animals. And he's just chilling. He wanted to watch today. So uh, say hi to Morty. Say hi, Morty. <laughs> he's so helpful sometimes. Okay. So here we are. Chapter 33, Animal Diversity and Body Plan. So um, this really corresponds with... Um, you know, we talked about Nidarian the last time we were in lab together, and a lot of both this is about like radial symmetry and the Nidarians and things like that. So we're going to actually go through each animal taxon um, as we move through this, the protostomes and the deuterostomes. And we'll talk about what those are in just a minute. So let's get started. All right, so I am totally biased, and maybe your book is too. Just kidding. Maybe. No, no, we're not. Um, so you're book actually says that animals are among the most important living organisms uh, and think about why that would be right um, so many functions animals serve so many functions in ecosystems that you really couldn't have energy um, recycling nutrient recycling without animal players at least not on an appreciable level so you find animals pretty much everywhere all sorts of shapes and sizes um, animals come in all different kinds of uh, packages. For example, Morty is an animal, I'm an animal, but you also have, you know, very small animals, um, you know, near microscopic, down to actually, yeah, microscopic animals, um, live in all different kinds of places. We have all different kinds of behavior. We actually have a whole class on animal behavior in the fall. Um, offered in the fall, and basically um, very diverse group of organisms. I mean, usually when people think of, you know, people who are super into biology, you have plant folks, you have fungi folks, but most of the time when you talk to a little kid about biology, they're going to talk to you about animals. So there are over a million species of animals described, a million and a half. Most of those are insects, and I'm trying to remember where the quote came from. Somebody's going to watch this and go, I know where that's from. But uh, someone, some scientist was asked, you know, in all of your studies about the living world, what did that teach you about the creator? And the, the scientist replied, he has an inordinate fondness for beetles. Okay, I thought it was funny. So it's really weird to tell jokes to a camera. So very diverse. Um and a few things that we all have in common. Animals are consumers, okay? Most animals have some load of locomotion, though there are exceptions. Particularly, you can think about the sponges, so periphera. The sponges don't move, they are sessile, okay? Animals are compri comprised of uh, all of these organisms have the same common ancestor, though. So we're a monophyletic group. We share a common ancestor, okay? We are all heterotrophic, so consumers, again, um, and within that heterotrophic umbrella, we have several feeding modes. So you have herbivores with the cute, adorable cow, carnivores, omnivores, and detritivores. This is hilarious, actually, because just this morning, hey, River, do you hear what I'm talking about in my lecture? Herbivores. Carnivores, eat meat, omnivores, plants and meat, and detritivores or decomposers, because detritus is decomposing matter. Where does have you heard have you learned that? Yeah. He's in a blanket for it right now. My son is learning the same thing in school. So so we're gonna go we'll move on. Okay. Because I assume that you know. How animals eat, but we need to make sure that you know herbivores, carnivore, carnivores, detritivores, and omnivores. Okay, all right, multicellular. So um, 
here I have here protists are unicellular, heterotrophic, and motile, but they are not animals. We have, you know, we talk about the protozoa, the animal-like protists, but they are themselves not animals, and that's important to remember. Okay, let's also talk about animals do not have cell walls, unlike plants. So that is one feature of the animals. And we have lots of different ways that we move around. So there's a broad diversity in movement and modes of locomotion in the animals. Really, we have much more complex movements than unicellular protists, even the protists that do are, are uh, motile. And one form of movement that is unique to animals, can you think of it? Flying. Flying is absolutely unique to animals. Um, so if you look here, you see all the amazing ways that animals can move. We can swim, we can fly. I can't fly, but that bird can fly. We can slither, you know, we can run and trot and whatever, what, whatever that cat's doing, you can stand. Yeah, that was actually not a joke. That's, yeah, so we have all these very different ways that we move. And we are, um, as I said, very diverse in form. So you have all the way down to, you know, microscopic mites all the way up to, you know, huge blue whales, sperm whales, large, some of the largest animals on Earth. You should know most animals are not vertebrates. Vertebrata is a subphylum of animals, um, of chordata, phylum chordata, okay? And uh, only, I think, so fewer than 60,000 of animal species are actually vertebrates. Most animals do not have um have backbones. Pretty cool. And we live everywhere. So we are, as animals, I say we because we are also animals, grouped into 35 to 40 phyla. And so most of these only have marine members, members of um, organisms that live in the sea. So most animals, most of the diversity of animals live in the sea. Um, arthropods, so we're going to talk about all of these arthropods mollusks and chordates have all been really successful in the ocean and are also dominant on land. So arthropods, those include the insects um, and mollusks. So we're going to do mollusks and arthropods in lab next week and the week after. So it's that mollusks next week. This week is flatworms and the following week will be arthropods. Chordates and echinoderms will do the last week. So you'll get a really nice up close, well, through a camera um, experience with these organisms. Okay, all right. So animals reproduce sexually. So also unlike in plants and fungi, um, our haploid gametes do not divide by mitosis first. So that's something to, to remember, okay? Um, in embryonic development, the zygote undergoes my mitosis and and that way develops into the embryo, but it is not, you don't have mitotic divisions of the haploid gametes. We also um, have tissues. Now, plants have certain kinds of tissue, but we have these structural and functional units that basically um, these collections of cells that perform specialized functions. Uh, that is a hallmark of animals. So, for example, um, you know, here I have you have connective tissue, nervous tissue, cardiac muscle, so specialized structural units, collections of cells that perform a specific task. I'm saying that again so you can remember it. So we have these tissues, but there is an exception. There are animals that do not have specialized tissues. Explore the explore. Sponges. Sponges don't have specialized. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, did you hear? He was singing, he's the map. Okay, we'll be in. Ah, so, all right. So let's talk about the five key innovations in animal evolution. So we're gonna talk about each of these in turn. I'm just, they're just listed here, okay? Symmetry, tissues, body cavities. Sorry, I don't know why. I didn't mean to laugh at that, that wasn't, okay. Patterns of development. We'll talk about that. And segmentation. 
okay? And features that evolved only once, those are, we see those as evidence of a close evolutionary relationship. So any innovation that evolved one time, we typically see as a synapomorphy, which if you recall, a synapomorphy is a shared derived characteristic, okay? Uh, when we see certain innovations evolve multiple times in different clades, we see that as evidence of convergent evolution, okay? All right, so let's talk about each one of these. Symmetry. So, you know that sponges lack symmetry. Virtually all other animals have some form of symmetry, and it's two kinds. Radial symmetry, so we talked about this in the Cnidarians, right? They're radially symmetrical, which is around the central axis, they radi radial symmetry, right? I'll show you. Ah, there it is. And bilateral symmetry, like you and me, down the sagittal plane. Okay, so let's talk about each one in turn. So here's radial symmetry. Check it out. So we talked about that. Of the animals we've seen so far in lab, periphera, the sponges, no definite symmetry. Cnidarians, cnidaria, radial symmetry. Okay, so this is symmetry about an axis here, a central axis. Okay, and essentially, it's they tend to be it's radially symmetrical. It's basically if you look here, and there's a central axis, right, and it, you could divide it in half, basically by any plane that goes through that center. Okay, so I mean, think about this. All the animals you can think of like that. Um, jellyfish, not thinking of cnidarians, but jellyfish. Um, starfish as adults are radially symmetrical, but we're going to talk about that in just a minute because they're actually, that's a little bit of a special case. Okay, so bilaterally symmetrical an animals are altogether called the balateria. That's just how we're referred to. So we're part of the balateria, okay? And basically what that means is if you if you bisect the animal down what we call the sagittal plane, which is here. If I were to take, oh, no, I was like, don't, don't get something that looks sharp, that looks scary. Um, I have a, never mind. So that's the sagittal plane. So we are symmetrical, roughly. I should say roughly symmetrical because if you've ever, seen a picture of somebody who was actually mirror image they looked weird but we are bilaterally symmetrical right you have an arm on each side well hope you might have an arm on each side if you don't maybe you don't maybe you lost it um anyway the the plan itself is you have one two legs two arms at least in our case right but it's you can divide the animal in half all right i don't think i need to explain that to you because it is you um but I just want to make sure you understand. So this is the sagittal plane you can divide there. All right, so there's a few advantages. So um, being bilaterally symmetrical is in and of itself an innovation because there are a couple of nice features of being bilaterally symmetrical. The first is cephalization, which means that uh, we evolved a defined brain area. So typically it's typically it's the anterior end of the animal, right? Um, and that's really useful. So you have a concentration of nervous tissue, that's helpful. But also, you know, if it's um, if you have cephalization, you also it's it's protective. Typically it's protective. You have some sort of protection of nervous tissue, right? It also allows for directional movement, which can be very helpful in terms of, you know acquiring food, just moving around in the ecosystem, okay? All right, so um, in some, some organisms, this is a little difficult to define, and I wanna move this for a second. Let me show you. Because, so this is an echinoderm, it's a sea star, right? These are larvae. So echinoderms are radially symmetrical, um, but the larvae are bilaterally symmetrical. I don't know, I don't know. So basically phylogenetic analysis has shown that um, the radial symmetry is actually a derived trait. They, um, 
they had a bilateral ancestor and that radial symmetry was a derived condition, which is what I'm saying here. So some organisms have been difficult to define, but looking back at phylogenetic analysis, we can say, oh, okay, you, you have echinoderms. They look, they are radially symmetrical as adults, but as larvae, they are bilaterally symmetrical, so they are part of the bilateria, okay? Right. All right, so tissues. Let's talk about um, the evolution of tissues as an innovation. So this is a really cool thing. So uh, I don't, I, I think that we've talked about this some, you know, when you have zy a zygote, so uh, a fertilized egg, those cells are, by, are totipotent. So what does totipotent mean? I think we've mentioned it before. Essentially, what totipotent means is all powerful. It means they can become anything. They are undifferentiated cells, okay? So as a zygote develops into an embryo, the cells specialize. And this is an irreversible process in animals, with one exception. You wanna guess? What is one exception? That's right, yes. Sponges. So this is crazy. So they, um, their cells do specialize, okay? But here's the thing. In all of the other animals, this process of specialization into, of cells into tissues with specific functions is an irreversible, irreversible, ooh, can't even talk. It's an irreversible process. But in the sponges, it's reversible. I know, it's crazy. So these guys, no defined tissues, but they do have specialization of cells, but those cells can de-differentiate, like go back and then re-differentiate into another kind of cell. That's what I'm getting us next. You just wanted to tell me because I'm recording. Okay, so crazy, right? All right, oh. let's talk about body cavities. Not like that. So, most animals have babies, embryos, well, embryos, collection of cells that are, um, that produce three germ layers, okay? The fact that the, most animals produce three germ layers means we are triploblastic, okay? However, there, is so, there are some exceptions, okay? Cnidarians are diploblastic. That means that they only have two germ layers that differentiate, and sponges do not have the germ layers that differentiate. So that's something to remember. And you can think about that in terms of the order that we're seeing animals. We're going from very simple animals and essentially moving to increasingly more complex animals, you might say. So we're talking about sponges. Well, they don't have germ layers. They don't have differentiated tissues. They may have specialized cells, but no special tissues, right? Cnidarians, you saw those next. They're radially symmetrical and diploblastic, two germ layers, just an endoderm and an ectoderm. Okay. Most of us, including humans, being triploblastic, have three germ layers. So we have an ectoderm that will eventually become our body coverings and our nervous systems, a mesoderm, which will become our muscles and skeleton, and an endoderm, which becomes our digestive organs and intestines. Hmm. So here you can see an embryo differentiating into those germ layers, and we're gonna talk about how that influences um, your body cavity. So what is a body, what is really a body cavity? Well, I'll tell you. So essentially this is just a space um, surrounded by mesoderm. That's what a true body cavity is, okay? So you're like, what? So remember, the mesoderm becomes your skeleton and your muscles. Okay, so the space, the space surrounded by those tissues. All right, we're gonna go through each of these. There's three kinds. So you have acelomate animals, pseudocelomate animals. So the animals we're going to see um, this week in lab, which are the flatworms and the roundworms. Lady helminthes are the flatworms. Nematoda are the um, roundworms. The flatworms are acelomates, 
the roundworms are pseudocoelomates. Okay, cool. So you have pseudocoelomates, no body cavity, pseudocoelomates that have a body cavity that sort of, we call it a pseudocoelom. It's not a true coelom. That's why it's called a pseudocoelom, right? Um, and so the pseudocoelom is between the mesoderm and the endoderm, and then the actual coelom and true coelomates is within the mesoderm. I'm going to show you each of these, and these are all in your book, so you could look at them, okay? So here, here we have a flatworm, casual, a little planaria, which you'll see in lab this week. They're adorable. All right, free-living, adorable flatworm. These organisms are acoelomates. If I were to, oh no, I cut them into a, or look at a cross section here, okay, you'll notice there's no body cavity between the digestive tract, which is derived from the endoderm, the surrounding tissue is at least, and the musculature, okay, which is derived from the mesoderm. Okay, there's nothing here. This is mesoderm. Mesodermally derived, I should say. All right, I. So that's a coelom. There ain't no coelom there. This, look at, you see that? There's no coelom. Whoa! Okay! Here's a nematode, a roundworm. So you're going to see vinegar eels in lab this week. Nematodes are everywhere, all over the place. Um, and one of my favorite nematodes is actually a free living soil nematode that we have learned so much about. Uh, cell and molecular biology from, and that is Cyanorhabditis elegans. Shout out to my first advisor ever. He was a C. elegans guy. He's a worm guy. First stuff I ever did research on. First organism I ever studied, C. elegans. So I have a very special place in my heart for nematodes. I mean, free-living nematodes. I don't, I don't want any nematodes in my heart. Okay, so pseudocelum here. So what's happening here? You have this pseudocelum, that's this open area here, between the endodermally derived tissue that surrounds the digestive tract and the mesodermally derived tissue. This is this a pseudocelum situation, which sounds like a great band name now that I say that. Pseudocelum situation. <laughs> this is good. Okay. I also want to point something out as just a little aside. I'm shouting out to my first mentor again today. He's getting a lot of shout outs today. Um, here is the digestive tract. I was always taught uh, by him. Inside your gut is outside your body, right? This is inside your body. This is still, this is inside your gut is outside your body. So that's just something to keep in mind. All right. And coelomates. All right. So example of this are the annelids, which we will see in lab, I think next week is our annelid lab all right includes the earthworms our buddies so here in the coelomates the body cavity is completely enclosed within mesodermally derived tissues that's the difference okay cool so you see you have mesodermally derived tissues surrounding that endodermally derived tissue which is surrounding and basically making the supporting the gut, right? And then out here, still mesoderm. So it's within, fully within the mesoderm. That is a coelomate animal. I right. Look about circulatory systems in animals. So you have two kinds, open circulatory systems and closed circulatory systems. All right. So in small animals, usually um, you have the circulatory system, there's very simple circulatory systems. You'll have, rather than having a closed system, you'll have um, an open system, like you see this in insects, where they still have hearts, but in very small animals, body movement actually is really important for the movement of, um, of blood throughout the body, or blood-like fluid, like hemolymph. Okay, so small animals, the nu their nutrients, oxygen are distributed and waste are removed by fluid in the body cavity whereas in larger animals you have a circulatory system okay and so you have an open circulatory system and a closed circulatory system and in the open circulatory system you actually have um, where 
your blood is pumped into these open areas called sinuses. In closed circulatory systems, they you do not have that, and you have connections, you have complete connections, even if it's very small um, capillaries. So just remember, you have open and closed circulatory systems in animals that have those. All right. Let's talk about, ooh, development. Yeah. So I also want to make you aware that if this kind of stuff is interesting to you, Dr. Jones teaches an animal development class in the spring. She's teaching it right now. So that's something to keep in mind down the line. You might want to take that as one of your biology electives. Okay, so let's talk about how the bilaterians develop. develop. I don't know why I said that the wrong way. So essentially what happens is you have your, so you have your fertilized egg. That's the zygote. Also, if you're wondering why I keep looking down, this is, instead of, I think I've said this before, instead of looking back, I look down now. So what you have, you have your zygote, your fertilized eggs, right? All right. And then you have mitotic divisions. This is what we call cleavage, right? And eventually that will form a ball, a hollow ball of cells. That here is the blastula. Then, this is a very important process. Then, gastrulation occurs. This is where it, the blastula then indents to form a two-layered ball. Okay? That, is, that makes it the gastrula. So, gastrulation gives rise to the gastrula where you have this blastopore. This is really important in animal development. This blastopore is an opening that opens into the archenteron. Archenteron, so enteron refers to the gut. You think of like enteric, enteron. So gut and arc is primitive, right? We've talked about archaebacteria, so archenteron, primitive gut. Okay, so this is an this is an embryo, this is embryonic development here in an animal. So the gastrula here has the blastopore that opens to the archenteron. All right. Okay, so the fate of that blastopore, really what it's going to be when it grows up, depends on what kind of animal is developing. Okay, you have two groups. And the rest of this semester, we're going to be talking about animals in the context of these two groups in the bilateria. All right, so... In the bilateria, you have protostomes, proto meaning first, stoma meaning mouth, so first mouth or mouth first, and deuterostomes, second mouth, mouth second. Okay, and I, so how do they differ? Most animals are protostomes. You're not a protostome, but most animals are, all right? So I, here we have all of these examples from the various animal phyla, right? So here's a mollusk, right? An arthropod, nematode, flatworm. So here, annelid. So here are the phyla. I should say that again. I went through that fast. So platyhelminthes, nematoda, mollusca, annelida, the annelids, the segmented worms, and arthropoda. Okay. So these are protostomes. What that means is that that blastopore becomes the animal's mouth. It makes its mouth first from that. Well, it makes its mouth from that, that embryonic blastopore. Okay. If the animal has an anus, not all of these animal, an, animal, animals do, it will develop either from another region in the embryo or from another, like it can develop from the blastopore um, as it, as it moves, as it develops fully. Um, but it could also be from another region of the embryo, depending on the animal. So protosomes, though, you just remember, the blastopore comes the mouth. Okay, now, the deuterostomes include, this is a sea urchin, so the echinoderms, phylum echinodermata, and the chordates, phylum chordata, which includes us. So... The blastopore becomes the anus. Uh, I gotta tell the joke. So, uh, 
this is a joke my, my first mentor told, told actually. Um, he said, uh, humans are deuterostomes, and that's probably why so many people are assholes. <laughs> Get it? Because we make our butt first from the blood. Okay. Huh. I, I'm recording this. I record all of these. What am I saying? I've been recording them all semester. This isn't new. Okay. So, deuterostomes. The blastopore becomes the anus. That's the chinoderms and cordates, like us. All right? You were a butt first. Well, you were a blastula. Well, you were a zygote. Anyway, as you were going through embryonic development, the anus came from the blastopore. All right. And your mouth developed later. You're welcome. Uh, you should tell your whole family that you learned that today. Take that to the bank. Hey, River. Did you know that when you were an embryo, I think I told you this, uh, you made your anus first? Yep. Okay. As an embryo, when you were developing, you made your anus before your mouth. do protostomes and deuterostomes differ besides that fundamental difference? Let's go through that real fast, okay? Well, let's not do it too fast. So, thankfully, you can pause me now. All right, so I think I have five, five, there's four, there's four ways, yes, yes. All right, so the first way that protostomes, so here's something you're going to want to remember, because I might ask you someday, how do protostomes and deuterostomes differ in their development? And you would go, well, the blastopore becomes the mouth and protostomes, whereas it becomes the anus and deuterostomes, and the mouth is after that. But there is more. So here is the more that you would need to remember forever. This will serve you well because you will see this in your later biology classes. You can't get away from this because it's, it's animal development. All right, so guess what we are? Animals. All right, so cleavage patterns are different. In protostomes, so when I talk about cleavage patterns, this is relative to um, the embryos, what we call the polar axis, which is here. It runs from top to bottom through the center, all right? And it determines how the resulting cells will lie with respect to one another. So, protostomes undergo spiral cleavage. What this means, if you see here, so these are new cells, and it shows you the direction of them being added, okay, or formed. So, new cells form to the right or left of previous cells in like a spiral, okay? So, you see it's going like this. Do, 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 do. Cleavage, all right. So, deuterostomes, they undergo, we undergo radial cleavage as embryos. So, new cells form on top. So, as opposed to being like, do, 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 right? And it's if, so this is if you're looking sideways at the protostome embryo and then up, right, over it. Now, if we're looking sideways at a deuterostome embryo, right, these are being just formed on top of the previous cells. So it's just a stacking, essentially. This is an overhead view right here, okay? So those cleavage patterns are different. Second thing, the fate of cells of, during development is different. So protostome cells have what we call determinate development, where the fate of cells are determined early, and deuterostomes have indeterminate development, where cell fate isn't determined for a while till after some cell divisions. This matters because if you were to excise a cell, since cells differentiate really early in protostomes, if you had an embryo and you excised a cell or cells from an embryo and det they're determinate, so it happens, that differentiation happens early, then the embryo won't develop. Like it will like, it will usually arrest development. Yeah. Um, not arrested development. Well, yeah, it'll sh it'll exhibit arrested development because some of those cells have already differentiated. Okay, in deuterostomes, since you don't have that determinate development, it's indeterminate development. Cell fate is not decided this early. So if you excise, 
take out some cells from a deuterostome embryo, from any kinoderm or chordate embryo, then the, the organism will still develop normally. I think that's cool. I'll fix this a little bit. That's weird. Ah, okay. Yeah, I think that's cool. All right, so that protostomes have determinate, early determination of cell fate. Deuterostomes have later determination of cell fate. What a nice way to remember that. I like it. There's a lot to remember it, honestly. Um, protostomes have, they make their mouth first. Okay. And they have early, which is determined. And they have, early cell determination. Whereas deuterostomes, like us, we do not make our mouth first. We wait and we wait, our cells wait to determine their fate. They're indeterminate. So that's one way that can help you remember it. Okay, the third thing is how we form our coelom. All right, so in protostomes, let me show you, there's this little, your book has, I'm gonna show you um, a figure from your book that's helpful for this, but here, so here on the bottom, these are the protostome. This is a protostome embryo and it, it, during coelomic development, coelom development. So here you just have cells. So they start down here, that's the purple stuff, okay? Cells moving apart to form a coelom, whereas in deuterostomes, cells pouch off. So you see here, the cells starting to grow off, all right? And then they pouch off. So. Protostomes, cells move apart. Deuterostomes, they pouch off. So to see all of those together, the four ways that um, organisms, oh no, the four ways that these animals differ in their development. I am very um, slyly plugging my computer back. I forgot that I unplugged it. Okay. Is, are, are cleavage patterns, all right? So in the protostomes, spiral cleavage. Let's just go through the protostomes. With determinate development, if I were to excise a cell, the embryo would not develop. The blastopore becomes the mouth, mouth first. And the coelom is derived from uh, cells that are just moving apart from each other, okay? Cool. So, here, in deuterostomes, you have, uh, whoa, sorry, you have radial cleavage, should be a minute, radial cleavage happening here, right, so those cells are being built on, they go on top of each other, all right, as the embryo develops. You have indeterminate development, so if you were to take out a cell, the embryo could still develop. The blastopore becomes the anus, and... Our coelom is derived from where these cells have started to grow and then they pouch off and become the coelom, all right? So here is an, an embryo, the mouth here and the anus here, all right. And this here is the digestive tract. Inside your gut is outside your body. All right. So another, uh, another important innovation of animals is segmentation. And the names of these segments, we call them somites. So you see, this is actually in a developing, um, a developing embryo. So you can see the segmentation here. You can also see it here in this lovely salmon. Okay, that was one key innovation. And the reason that that was so helpful was because it allows you to be, well, it lets you move, right? You can be a lot more flexible and a lot more efficient you have segments because they can move independently. Okay. Um, it also allows for redundant organ systems. So an example of this would be in the annelids. In annelids, you often like you'll have organs in each of certain organs in each of these segments, and you have some redundancy in that. So that's actually really helpful because if something were to happen to your body, there's some functional redundancy in your body so that that function can be overtaken. All right, so this is an example of something where we have convert a, a, a trait that um, shows convergent evolution. And remember, if you see convergent evolution, that trait is likely to be very advantageous. So segmentation was one really advantageous way that we were able to move so well and also to have functional redundancy in adult animals. Cool. 
which makes this a little bit less, uh, less, not sensitive, a little less vulnerable. <laughs> okay. So I think this is, I think I'm going to stop here today. Wow, I went a lot quicker than I thought I would. Oh no, did I go too fast? Okay, well, you can let me know. But um, when we, on Friday, we're going to talk about the actual animal squids. I know, guys, I know. So, um, you know, let's just, let's just do a couple of these. Would you care? I mean, you could, what am I saying? You could stop the video. So, <clears throat> yeah, let's do this. So, let's just do a couple of these uh, on animal phylogeny, shall we? So um, there is some common ground between traditional and new phylogenies, but there is some disagreement among biologists. Not a ton. Usually it has to do with um, just certain groupings of organisms. And really, you have people who are what we call clumpers and, um, and dividers. Um, so traditionally, animal phylogeny has been based on morphological characteristics, life history characteristics, some molecular data where it was available, but Traditionally, it wasn't available, right? Whereas now, and you know this from when we talk so much about phylogeny, a lot of that is based on molecular evidence, right? Um, we're still trying to develop those phylogenies fully, though, based on molecular data. And sometimes you have new studies that have differing conclusions than others. So you should know that animal phylogeny is an ever-evolving discipline. Um, and if you're interested in that, that could be a something you pursue going forward okay cool but molecular data has been super great because and you know that when we talked about evolution right molecular data has been hugely helpful in resolving many animal phylogenies or even changing up animal phylogenies and correcting animal phylogenies okay cool so uh we just so in animals so let's let's review here so we are in domain eukarya right? Kingdom animalia. So now we're going to talk about each animal phylum. So remember kingdom, well, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. All right. So our, all of these animals are divided into distinct phyla, right? And we're going to learn the major ones. All right. So we divide animals into periphera, which are the sponges, and humanozoa, the body else. So let's think about what that means. Humanozoa, so zoa means animal, right? You mean true. So humanozoa, that basically just means, well, metazoans, we talk about metazoans, those are animals, okay? Animal like. So humanozoan, everybody else, all the other animals, okay? All right. So you have cnidaria, which you've learned, right? We learned periphera, cnidaria. Those were the radially symmetrical animals, right? And then you get to the bilateria. So the cnidaria and bilateria are still part of eumetazoa, okay? Cool. So most of the phylogenies and deuterostomes haven't changed. Usually what molecular data has done is resolved a lot of the phylogenies for protosome animals. So that's just something to know. But the, the main thing to remember is how, you know, this class we're thinking about how animals are grouped, right? So from here, I want you to really just think about, you know, you got periphera, all right, then you've got the eumetazoa. Within that, you have cnidaria, which is its own phylum. Bilateria is not a phylum, but a group, okay? All right, so um, I think this is where I want to stop just for now. Um, and we are going to finish up animal phylogenies, which we only have a couple of slides, all right, to talk about the different clades of animal phylogenies and finish up those issues. I just don't want to keep you on here for too, too long. Also, my video will be too big somehow. I know that there are ways to fix that. Actually, I do compress the files, but um, even then, I know it takes time for you to watch these. So if you have any questions about this, I've already gotten some great questions. If you have questions, Post them in the discussion group on Schoology, or um, or you can email them to me, though I encourage you to use the discussion group so everyone can see your question. Because if you have a question, I promise you, at least one to probably 20 
other people have the same question. So let me know if you have questions. And just as a reminder, be sure after you watch this video, you got one more video to watch where we finish up animal phylogeny. I hope you're studying for your exam. Make sure you watch the lab video. I think that's actually pretty fun because it's flatworms and nematodes. There's a dissection on there. And be sure you turn in your worksheet for that lab by the end of the week. And the last reminder is Friday at 8 a.m. We're meeting on Google Meet. There's an update on Schoology with that. It's the same code. It's the same link as last time. So it's the same update that I posted a few days ago. And we will meet at 8 a.m. optionally to answer any of your questions and to review anything you'd like to review before the exam. Okay. Well, I will see you all later in the internet. Yeah, okay. Have a good day. Go outside. It's really nice outside. Please go outside.